Ibn Khaldun. Abd al-Rahman ibn Muhammad is generally known as Ibn Khaldun after a remote ancestor. His parents, originally Yemenite Arabs, had settled in Spain, but after the fall of Seville, had migrated to Tunisia. He was born in Tunisia in 1332 AD, where he received his early education and where, still in his teens, he entered the service of the Egyptian ruler Sultan Barkuk. His thirst for advanced knowledge and a better academic setting soon made him leave this service and migrate to Fez. This was followed by a long period of unrest marked by contemporary political rivalries affecting his career. This turbulent period also included a three-year refuge in a small village Kualat ibn Salama in Algeria, which provided him with the opportunity to write Mukadama, the first volume of his world history that won him an immortal place among historians, sociologists and philosophers. The uncertainty of his career still continued, with Egypt becoming his final abode where he spent his last 24 years. Here he lived a life of fame and respect, marked by his appointment as the chief Malachite judge and lecturing at the Al-Azhar University, but envy caused his removal from his high judicial office as many as five times. Ibn Khaldun was a Renaissance man, the real father of sociology. He defined the foundations of sociology more than four centuries before Auguste Comte discovered them. Ibn Khaldun lived in an era when the Muslim nation in North Africa and the Iberian Peninsula disintegrated into a multitude of city-states fighting against each other. At the same time the Spaniards were uniting their kingdoms and steadily taking over the Muslim city-states in Iberia. He was directly involved in the political intrigue and served several Muslim rulers in different capacities ranging from diplomatic envoy to minister. His first-hand observations led him to believe that societies are not controlled by resources or policies. He concluded that societies are living organisms that experience cyclic birth, growth, maturity, decline, and ultimately death due to universal causes. Each phase of the cycle lasts for several generations. He also described the process through which peaceful or violent migrants blend with the native population to form a homogeneous society subject to the universal cycles. He correctly associated the maturity stage of any social system with affluence, luxury and reluctance to perform menial tasks or defend the society against external threats. This leads to the employment of foreigners and mercenaries which initiates the conflicts that lead to the decline phase. He identified the impact of climate and available resources on migrations and social changes. He also identified the impact of governmental policy and taxation on social change. Ibn Khaldun is a great Muslim thinker of the 14th century b. 1332 d. 1406 a.d. Modern writers are inclined to consider him as a pioneer or a precursor in the science of society and the philosophy of history. Some of them consider him as the first sociologist in the history of mankind and even the founder of modern sociology. His prolegomena, which is the primary subject of study in the present work, is regarded by one authority as one of the six important monographic works in general sociology. The aim of this dissertation is not to study either Ibn Khaldun or his theory in minute detail. In fact, other modern students have successfully achieved that task. The aim of this work is, rather, a different one. Our aim here is to see Ibn Khaldun in a different light, or, to use Mannheim's term, through a perspective which is greatly different from the customary one. Ibn Khaldun lived in a culture quite different from our present culture, and was accustomed to view the world within a frame of reference with which we are perhaps completely unfamiliar. The first duty that lies, therefore, before us, in order to be able to understand Ibn Khaldun, is to reconstruct his perspective or his frame of reference anew, and to try to look at the social phenomena through it. In this work, the space which is devoted to the discussion of Ibn Khaldun's theory per se is small in comparison to that devoted to the reconstruction of the perspective and the categories of thought according to which Ibn Khaldun and his fellow writers viewed their world. This work is, as its subtitle shows, a study in the sociology of knowledge. Ibn Khaldun is then taken as a point in case. He is studied primarily to show how his theory and the theories produced in his culture can fit into the general scheme of the sociology of knowledge as recently developed by modern sociologists. 
Ibn Khaldun's chief contribution lies in philosophy of history and sociology. He sought to write a world history preamble by a first volume aimed at an analysis of historical events. This volume, commonly known as Mukaddama or Prolegomena, was based on Ibn Khaldun's unique approach and original contribution and became a masterpiece in literature on philosophy of history and sociology. The chief concern of this monumental work was to identify psychological, economic, environmental and social facts that contribute to the advancement of human civilization and the currents of history. In this context, he analyzed the dynamics of group relationships and showed how group feelings, al, asabia, give rise to the ascent of a new civilization and political power and how, later on, its diffusion into a more general civilization invites the advent of a still new asabia in its pristine form. He identified an almost rhythmic repetition of rise and fall in human civilization, and analyzed factors contributing to it. His contribution to history is marked by the fact that, unlike most earlier writers interpreting history largely in a political context, he emphasized environmental, sociological, psychological and economic factors governing the apparent events. This revolutionized the science of history and also laid the foundation of Umraniyat sociology. Apart from the Mukaddama that became an important independent book even during the lifetime of the author, the other volumes of his world history Kitab al-Ibar deal with the history of Arabs, contemporary Muslim rulers, contemporary European rulers, ancient history of Arabs, Jews, Greeks, Romans, Persians, etc., Islamic history, Egyptian history and North African history, especially that of Berbers and tribes living in the adjoining areas. The last volume deals largely with the events of his own life and is known as Al-Tazraf. This was also written in a scientific manner and initiated a new analytical tradition in the art of writing autobiography. A book on mathematics written by him is not extant. Ibn Khaldun's influence on the subject of history, philosophy of history, sociology, political science and education has remained paramount ever since his life. His books have been translated into many languages, both in the East and the West, and have inspired subsequent development of these sciences. For instance, Professor Gum Plows and Colosio consider Mukadama as superior in scholarship to Machiavelli's The Prince written a century later, as the former bases the diagnosis more on cultural, sociological, economic and psychological factors. Ibn Khaldun employed a revolutionary approach to writing history, rejecting the prevalent notion of history consisting of mere facts. He acknowledged that a documentation of history is directly dependent on who is interpreting it, when, and where. Historians are using this methodology even today. Along with analyzing how the Islamic civilization unraveled over time, he has left a detailed study of nomadic and non-nomadic life, dynasties and caliphates, and society in general. His analysis of the rise and fall of civilizations has formed the basis of social science, the science of civilization and sociology, according to 1001 Inventions, Muslim Heritage in Our World. Ibn Khaldun was also a forerunner in terms of his economic theory, paving the way for economics as we know it today. His work of course, history, in the sense of a written record of past events, existed before Ibn Khaldun. Ancient writers like Tacitus and Thysides became famous for their historical accounts. It is also true that a sense of history as having purpose existed before Ibn Khaldun. In fact, it is one of the basic premises of Christianity. That said, Ibn Khaldun made a great contribution to the progress of Western thought by his theory of history as logical procession of events which follow from each other in reasonable ways. He himself considered this conclusion to be so significant that he devoted most of the Mukaddama prolegomena to history to explaining the details, declaring several times that he had created an entirely new field of study. By changing history from the telling of stories to an observable science which could explain and perhaps even predict human behavior, he claimed to have changed the understanding of human behavior entirely. 
Although many of his basic explanations are today discarded, the idea that such explanations could exist has led modern thinkers to claim Ibn Khaldun as a founder in the philosophy of history, historiography, anthropology, and sociology. A-S-A-B-I-Y-Y-A-H Asabiya or Asabiya Arabic refers to social solidarity with an emphasis on unity, group consciousness and sense of shared purpose, and social cohesion, one originally in a context of tribalism and clanism. It was a familiar term in the pre-Islamic era, but became popularized in Ibn Khaldun's Muqaddimah where it is described as the fundamental bond of human society and the basic motive force of history. Asabiya is neither necessarily nomadic nor based on blood relations, rather, it resembles philosophy of classical republicanism. In the modern period, the term is generally analogous to solidarity. However, it is often negatively associated because it can sometimes suggest loyalty to one's group regardless of circumstances or partisanship. Ibn Khaldun also argued that Asabiya is cyclical and directly related to the rise and fall of civilizations. It is most strong at the start of a civilization, declines as the civilization advances, and then another more compelling Asabiya eventually takes its place to help establish a different civilization. Ibn Khaldun uses the term Asabiya to describe the bond of cohesion among humans in a group-forming community. The bond, Asabiya, exists at any level of civilization, from nomadic society to states and empires. Asabiya is most strong in the nomadic phase, and decreases as civilization advances. As this Asabiya declines, another more compelling Asabiya may take its place. Thus, civilizations rise and fall, and history describes these cycles of Asabiya as they play out. Ibn Khaldun argues that each dynasty or civilization has within itself the seeds of its own downfall. He explains that ruling houses tend to emerge on the peripheries of great empires and use the much stronger Asabiya present in those areas to their advantage, in order to bring about a change in leadership. This implies that the new rulers are at first considered barbarians by comparison to the old ones. As they establish themselves at the center of their empire, they become increasingly lax, less coordinated, disciplined and watchful, and more concerned with maintaining their new power and lifestyle at the center of the empire, i.e., their internal cohesion and ties to the original peripheral group, the Asabiya, dissolves into factionalism and individualism, diminishing their capacity as a political unit. Thus, conditions are created wherein a new dynasty can emerge at the periphery of their control, grow strong, and effect a change in leadership, beginning the cycle anew. Ibn Khaldun also further states in the Muqaddimah that, dynasties have a natural life span like individuals, and that no dynasty generally lasts beyond three generations of about forty years each. In the first generation, the people who established the civilization are used to privation and to sharing their glory with each other they are brave and rapacious. Therefore, the strength of group feeling continues to be preserved among them. In the second generation, when the dynasty moves from privation to luxury and plenty, the people become used to lowliness and obedience. But many of the old virtues remain, and they live in hope that the conditions that existed in the first generation may come back, or they live under the illusion that those conditions still exist. By the third generation, the people have forgotten the period of toughness, as if it had never existed. Luxury reaches its peak among them, because they are so much given to a life of prosperity and ease. They become dependent on the dynasty. Group feeling disappears completely. People forget to protect and defend themselves and to press their claims. When someone comes and demands something from them, they cannot repel him. What it's all about. The most basic premise of the Mukadama was that the purpose of civilization was to bring people together in larger and larger groups so that they could produce things that they couldn't produce individually and to provide for common defense. However, he also recognized that people as a general rule are selfish, violent, and cruel and that bringing them together in cities exacerbates these tendencies. Therefore, the purpose of the Dala Six can be seen as being a way to keep a densely packed society together despite its inherent tendency to fall apart. 
The responsibility of a good leader was to keep society stable and the measure of his greatness was the degree to which he succeeded. The thing which kept some societies together while others fell apart was something called a sabia. This is an Arabic word which can mean solidarity, or group consciousness but is usually translated group feeling. At the most basic level, a sabia is something that a person feels for his family. In this respect, it might also be translated as brotherhood. When a ruler is successful he manages to spread the asabiya to all members of the society, so that all think of one another as they would think of their own brothers. Because of the limited scope of his study and his inability as a medieval Muslim to think of religion in a functionalist way, Ibn Khaldun never mentioned the role which religion can serve in promoting asabiya. Predictive History Ibn Khaldun stated that, given the natural progress of things, Adala would fall apart in four generations. This is based on his observation that, while the concentration of people makes possible the specialization to support a full-time government and army and religious hierarchy, although he appears to have missed that part it also introduces luxuries into people's lives which eventually corrupt them with selfishness and deteriorate the asabia. A particularly strong ruler can delay the collapse, but in Ibn Khaldun's theory, events are inherently cyclical and each dollar contains within itself the seeds of its own destruction. Unfortunately, perhaps because of Ibn Khaldun's own experience which mostly dealt with very similar and short-lived states, some of his conclusions are very obviously in opposition to observed history. Some dollars last considerably longer than four generations for reasons other than strong group feeling, while others, including many that are strongly unified in nationalism, fall apart almost instantly. Even today, there has yet to be any definitive theory which will allow for the prediction of future history. Nevertheless, Ibn Khaldun's work changed the way in which humans understand each other and made possible